evening, ladies and gentlemen. The pages of this book, Orinoco Adventure, describe the magnificent one-man expedition of the young man on my right, Mr. Hector Athebus of Columbia, South America. But Mr. Athebus did more than keep a diary. He took motion picture films of the exciting highlights of his journey on the Orinoco River, into regions of unexplored jungles, uncharted rapids, and finally to the home of the Heveros, the headhunters of South America. And it was these same Heveros who were so amazed at Mr. Athebus' lone wolf adventuring that they gave him the well-deserved title, Ningi Waikama, which means literally, he who journeys alone. For the next 30 minutes, we cordially invite you to join Mr. Hector Athebus, who came more than 3,000 miles to show us the actual films of his Orinoco adventure. <laughs> here to begin tonight's true story adventure is Jack Douglas. Among the growing armies of people who roam the face of the earth in search of thrills and excitement, Hector Athebus of Bogota, Colombia is known as the lone wolf of the adventure world. He travels light and he travels alone. A rather singular fact which even the Heveros were able to comprehend and appreciate. Although a long way from his present home in South America, the U.S. is his native land and we're extremely happy to welcome to our show the transplanted New Yorker from Bogota, Mr. Hector Athebus. Ningi Waikama, Mr. Athebus. How it's, are you, Jack? It's nice to see you. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Athebus, you have one of the most interesting backgrounds, I think, of anyone that I've met on our program series, and I wonder if you'd share some of the highlights with our audience. Thank you, Jack. As you know, I was born in New York of a Spanish father and a Colombian mother. Then, after spending several years in South America, I came up here and went to uh, MIT. I was there for two years before volunteering in the United States Army, where I spent three years going overseas to Germany. Then I came back to the States, was discharged, and finished my MIT degree in 1947. So that you've got an engineering degree from MIT. That's right. Well, now let's talk adventure. How many of these lone wolf expeditions have you made and where? Well, all together in the Amazon and Orinoco, I've made seven expeditions, and in Africa, three. Now, in addition to the Orinoco section of your film, we're also going to see the Heveros. Now, in your opinion, are these Heveros really still headhunters, or is that something that you adventurers put out to keep the tourists away? No, they are still headhunters, and they will continue to, to be so, because their wars are wars of revenge. Uh, they're tribal wars. And That's right. They don't yes. necessarily go headhunting, of course, when outsiders are no, present. No. Thank you very much, Mr. Thebus. Suppose we join you now in your lone adventure into the uncharted jungles of South America. This, Jack, is the village where I started my Orinoco expedition from. It's the village of Tumaco on the Pacific coast of Colombia. The village looks more like a South Sea island with its thatched roofs and bark siding. We wanted first to find and meet the Heveros, and then to continue on to the wild Orinoco Basin. Along the way, we were to meet some of the least known and most colorful tribes of Indians in all of South America. These two men that I have with me, I picked them up at Tumaco. One of them was a boy that came from the Hevero land and who was returning to his home. And this other one, the one on the right, is a professional smuggler. He's smuggling merchandise, manufacturing in Colombia, and he's taking it to Ecuador. Did you know that he was smuggling this merchandise at the time? Well, yes, because this is not a commercial route, and it's the best way to get it into Ecuador to go with the smugglers. They always recommend you the smugglers I as see. the guy. <laughs> <laughs> we already abandoned the smuggler, and this is the Cayapas River, and we are making a stop here to eat. The main diet is canned food, and for fresh food, we usually get bananas and yucca and all the plants that the natives grow throughout the area. In a small dugout, you can't take very much of tins. We also depend on our food by hunting and getting the agricultural products that the Indians make. We continue up the river, and we're passing our first Cayapa Indians. 
the Cayapas live in the very upper part of the river because they don't want to mix with the tribes that live at the lower part. And we arrived to this first village of these Indians. We need a rest and food and we hope to stay at this village for at least several days. So I try to make friends by giving these people some of my precious cigarettes. Actually, Jack, these Indians have been using tobacco for centuries. As you know, the Spaniards found the tobacco plantations when they arrived to America the first time in the 1500s. We unload because we were going to stay here for a few days. The houses of the Cayapas are also built on stilts so to keep the bugs and the snakes out. We found the women making and preparing the food for the men when they will return from the fields. They're very good looking people. They are very pretty girls. Here we see them pounding the bananas. They live on bananas and you bananas. They paint mustaches on themselves, which gives them a very funny and humorous look. They put as many bobby pins as they can on their hair. When they can get them from the traders. There's a village down about 50 miles where they go and buy things. I got two Kayapa boys to continue up the river, and we found that the river became very shallow, full of stones, and the current quite strong. So it was very difficult to negotiate it. I had to go on shore from time to time and unload everything and push the dog out past the rough waters. Of course, the motor was completely useless because the river was very shallow and we couldn't put the motor in, otherwise we'd break off the propeller. The further on we went, the worse it became. Now we had low-hanging vegetation that was on our way. Finally, we reached this large waterfall and steep rapids that made it impossible to continue by dugout. We just couldn't do it anymore. So we decided to go on foot, unload everything, and climb up the steep banks of the waterfall to continue on through the jungle. We came across this group of Colorado Indians. I joined them and continued with these people and told the boys, the Kayapa boys, to go back to their village. We passed on the way a nest of boas Whenever we meet snakes on the jungle, you never kill them if they are not poisonous. But if it's a poisonous snake, you always make sure to destroy it so they won't bite anybody. We arrive at the village of the Colorados, and we found the witch doctor was painting his uh, wives. His wives, you say? Yes, the witch doctor is the only one who is allowed more than one wife. As a rule, he has three. He uses the juice from a seed, which is black. The witch doctor pierces his nose with a small stick as an ornament. The men paint their hair red. That's where they got the name of Colorado's. This is Compadre Julio, the witch doctor of the village. He's very well known throughout the area for his cures. He had an oven there where he placed stones. He heated them there, then he made this hole in the ground and put the stone in. And this man who is suffering from rheumatism is going to put his leg over the hole. So he gets sort of a steam bath there. Well, you know, so many of these witch doctors, contrary to popular belief, do use a great deal of common sense. Perhaps that's why they hold their job as well as they do. Yes, that's correct, Jack. This is the Pastaso River winding down the Andes. We were now heading towards the Hevero country. We were met by these three Alama girls on the river that took us over to their village. These girls were making chicha. As you know, chicha is masticated and that is what causes the fermentation and then it's mixed with water and you have to take the conventional drink, of course, every time you arrive at one of these villages. The girls here wore beards instead of mustaches. They painted beards on. Gee, yeah. she's pretty, isn't she? She is a very pretty girl, yes. 
I decided to show them a little trick. You know, this is a spring snake. Well, come on, open it. <laughs> <laughs> we continue down river. I got some men of the Alamas, and we reached the confluence with the Pastaza River, where the current was very, very strong. We had to go up the river quite a ways to cross it so that we would be taken down by the current to the spot where we wanted to go. You don't seem to be able to do anything with that current. It's just sweeping you sideways, yes, isn't it? Yes, so much so that I decided not to continue on the river because I was afraid that the canoe would turn over and I would lose all my equipment. Fortunately, we met here our first Hebrew Indian who showed us a point at which the river can be crossed by foot so that we can reach the first Hivero village. Thank you, Mr. Thebus. Part two of your Orinoco adventure will continue in just a moment. Jack, using the very good advice of the Hivero boy, we were able to cross the river at this point. I then sent the Hivero boy back to his village to bring some people to help carry our supplies across the river. We had a little girl with us that was one of the wives of one of the boys. After we crossed the river, we made a stop to dry ourselves out. And then we continue on through the jungle. Very difficult pass here. You should never play a hero in the jungle because if you do, you might fall down and break a leg. And if you break a leg in the jungle, well, you're just about done because there's no medical care or anything like that. And if gangrene sets in, you're done. This is the Hivero chief, Sando, and one of his wives. It was at this village that they had a sensu that I wanted to see and photograph. What, what exactly is a sensu? A sensu is a shrunken head. That's the name that they have for it. I tried to be as friendly as I could with these people because whenever they see a white man coming in, they always think, that it's an official from the government who is coming to punish them for having killed someone. And they hide all the shrunken heads. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's right. So I stayed about a week here, talking to them about the different things, then playing with their babies, making friends with them. If those Hiveros ever elect a new governor, why, you're going to be in, aren't Probably, you? Probably, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this little baby is painted black to avoid exposure to the sun and his father is very, very proud of him. This is Hembekete, son of Ambusha, and that is the Sansa of Yauri, son of Paltasara. He is the boy who killed this man, cut his head and shrunk it. After the Hebrews, I returned briefly to civilization to pick up a plane and fly into the village of Mitu on the Valpes River and resume the journey into the Orinoco Basin itself. Here is the boat coming to unload all our equipment. The people of Mitu are very happy because a plane got in, bringing them merchandise from Bogota. It's a time for fooling around and playing, for it's very seldom that a plane gets into this area. You get a plane in about once every month. It's a big event in their lives when that monthly plane comes in, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Sometimes they don't even get it once a month because the waters are very low. Three, four or five months might go without a plane. The village of Mitu, a small town of some 300 natives and a few whites. I took this man, Pedro Pablo, as my guide and some Cubeo Indians. This is the Valpes River, which as you can see is very wide and right here it seems very calm but actually it's a very treacherous river taking the lives of many people every year because of the many rapids it has. Right here, we arrive at the first rapid and as you can see, Jack, it would be very difficult to cross. That's quite a drop, isn't it, for any river? It's even worse when you see it in real life. We took the dugout across near the shore and we pushed it through we had to load and unload every time we came to a rapid. The waters are very rough and every year the Valpes River takes about five to six lives. These Indians that you see here decided to make a run of the rapid 
and you will see that it's going to end up in disaster because one of their dugouts is going to turn over. They're very good swimmers. That's the overturned dugout yeah, that's there, right, isn't it? Right there, you can see one of the boys with a paddle waving it in the air. We finally found a small channel through which we could lower the dugout and a very funny thing happened at this point. We went looking for an Indian to show us where the best place was to cross this rapid and we found him in his hammock suffering severe pains because his wife had just given birth to a baby. He was uh, suffering pain. Yes. <laughs> These Indians that you see here are the Cubeos, and when the wife has a baby, they go into bed for three days and pretend to be going through a great deal of pain. The men, that is. The men, yeah. Uh -huh. We arrived at Pedro Pablo's place, and we made a stop to put a roof on the big boat. We built this structure on the dugout, and in the meantime, the boys were making the roof out of thatched leaves to avoid exposure to the sun and to the rain. Actually, they make very good roofs and are perfectly waterproof once they're put on. The boys are very good swimmers because, as I told you, Jack, they have these dangerous rapids there and they learn to swim at a very early age. These people that lived at Pedro Pablo's place are riding on my rubber boat. I always bring this boat along with me as a way of making friends. The Indians love it, and oh, you should see the little boys, how crazy they go <laughs> over that. You're losing your passenger list here. <laughs> oh, you did that on purpose. Oh, probably. <laughs> we got ready to leave. This boy wanted to go with us, but I decided it wouldn't be right with his parents, so we made him stay. We left Pedro Pablo's place in this big boat and continued until we reached a trading post. How much do you have to pay these native paddlers when they go along with you like this? You might say you pay them the equivalent of 25 cents a day. Mm -hmm. It's quite cheap. Right here at this place, we found a white man's trading post and I took an opportunity for shaving. The Hivaro chief had given me these two little chili crisps and they are watching me shave. Very cute little birds. They are very much like parrots. They are of the same family. This little boy decided to clean my mosquito bites off. Is a boy from the mission at Me Too who was living at the white man's uh, <laughs> trading post. We got three dugouts now because this small river that we were going to go through was quite narrow and we couldn't get the big boat through. Very difficult waters to navigate. As you can see, it's very narrow and it's full of vegetation. Unfortunately, the water was very low which made the tree trunks and everything that had dropped down be on our way. So we had to pull and drag and push, and even at places we had to actually use a saw and an axe to cut away trees that were falling across the way. Are they the result of storms, the river strewn with these trees and logs and whatnot? Well, they are the result of the waters overflowing them and then they rot away the roots and uh, all of a sudden they just fall down. You seem to be losing weight rather rapidly as this journey well, progresses. Uh, yes, Jack. As a rule, when I go on these trips, I always lose a lot of weight, about 10 or 15 pounds, because the diet is not what it should be, as you can imagine. Hunting is very scarce and you have to live on, well, this food, for example, which is the usual chicha. You just pass it down day. when you're rowing like that? You let it float down and float pick down it up? Float down and everybody <laughs> takes a drink. Finally, we came out to the waters of the Orinoco River. Here you see Duida Mountain climbed for the first time by an American group and never climbed since then. The Orinoco on its upper part we were lucky to find a lot of animals and hunting. This is a cabezon turtle, which is very dangerous because of the beak it has. Yes, it looks almost like the beak of a hawk, doesn't it? Yeah. When the boys go swimming after them, they are very careful. Otherwise, they get a very nasty bite. We continue up the river. 
We shot a taper on the river that was swimming, and we made a stop to cook it. You see the taper right there. It's very much like a big pig. They weigh as much as 150, 180 pounds. When we shot it, he was swimming, and right away the piranhas got at him. As you can see, they started to eat his food off. Before you could get him out of the water. Before we could get him out of the water. Piranhas attacked him, uh-huh. Yes. We're cooking the tapered meat on the boat. We always try to cook on the boat as we went along, because if you stop to cook, it delays the trip quite a great deal. We continue out the river, and we saw that mountain there. This is the first Waika Indian that we saw, and he's signaling to us that he's hungry. You can see he's patting his stomach, and he's asking us to approach the shore and get him on the boat. We did so, and I really don't know what he's talking about there. That's when I was taking his picture. We managed to get him to take us to the mountain so that I could see the jungles of the Orinoco and see the river. So we went up the mountain. Here, Jack, I got a look at the wild Orinoco Basin as it has been seen by few civilized men, even in these modern times. As far as the human eye can see, there is nothing but brutal, primitive jungle. We couldn't see a single sign of human life. And as we stood here on this mountain, I wondered to myself if this lost world would ever be conquered and civilized in our generation. This one overpowering scene was worth the five months of hardships and the sacrifice of my Orinoco adventure. much, Mr. Thebus. Deep down inside, were you really as secure and confident as you try to make the Heveros believe? Well, actually, I feel more secure and more confident in those wild places than uh, in the civilized towns, because these people are usually good people who are not spoiled by civilization, and you can travel freely through their territories so long as you don't interfere either with their morals, or their women, or their customs. Well now, since you journeyed alone, I assume that the natives had to help you with the picture taking whenever we saw you in the pictures yourself, that is. Yes, that's right, Jack. I set the camera on a tripod, and I would have one of the native boys push the button, and then everybody would look, and I would act right in front of the camera. Uh -huh. Well now, these people are pagan, are they not? Yes, in the popular sense, I should say they are pagan. Well, then let's go back to a comment that you made earlier. Now, we in the outside civilized world get our moral standards and moral concepts from our religion and somewhat from our laws. Now, if these people are pagans in the sense that we know it, how do you account for their high moral standard, which you praised a moment ago? Well, any group of people that gather together to live together have to develop their own morals, their own laws, and their own religion by necessity. In other words, you feel that it's something that they have more or less inherited gradually. They've begun to realize that if they don't have high moral standards, that they will just be corrupted and completely dissolved. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Well, before you settle down completely, I hope you'll remember your promise to show us your fine African adventure, The Road to Timbuktu. We understand it's quite... We'd love to see it. Well, I would love to show it to you, Jack, because it's always a good excuse to come back to the good old USA. Thank you very much, Mr. Hector. Mm -hmm.